Well, we are uh, going to be looking in the book of Acts this morning. And throughout the book of Acts, of course, we see the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of people. The Holy Spirit changes people on the inside, but that inside change that we see the Holy Spirit doing throughout the book of Acts always results in an outside mission to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world. That's why we're calling this sermon series the Inside Out Gospel, because God works on the inside for an outside mission. Now, you will, of course, remember that at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus Christ raises from the dead, and now the book of Acts continues that story. Acts starts with the risen Jesus sort of hanging around with the disciples. He gives them this mission, among other things, to spread the gospel, and that is our mission too. And then, after he gives them this mission, Jesus rises into the air. He ascends to heaven, and he tells them that the Holy Spirit is coming to empower them for this mission that he's given them. And so after Jesus ascends, the disciples head back to town, and they worship together, and they organize a church together, and they wait for the Holy Spirit. Now, last week, uh, Pastor Betsy preached on the coming of the Holy Spirit. The disciples are waiting, and the promise of Jesus comes true. The Holy Spirit comes on what we call the day of Pentecost, and the believers speak in other languages, and tongues of fire appear. And so now, they have everything that they need to carry out this mission that Jesus gave them. I love that, that Pastor Betsy preached on the Pentecost text when it wasn't Pentecost. You know, Pentecost will happen in a couple of weeks. We, we mark that day each year. But it was so good, wasn't it, to just look at the, the text of the coming of the Holy Spirit just to learn rather than because of the calendar. Now, of course, this is a great section of the book of Acts to be in. So when, when Pentecost does come, we'll still be seeing the results of Pentecost. So that's going to be good. But, but the Holy Spirit has come. Now that has just happened in the book of Acts. And this morning, our text is on the very same day. So what we're going to be reading is still the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has just come. And then immediately after that, Peter gets up and he preaches a sermon. Now, we already knew that Peter was the head of the church because of some of the things that Jesus has said, but also because in chapter 1, we saw Peter sort of leading while they were organizing the leadership of the church, Peter was, was in charge there. But uh, we haven't really seen Peter in action yet until now. Now we get to really see Peter do his thing, and it is amazing. So you'll remember there's a crowd of people around the believers when the Holy Spirit comes. And this crowd sees incredible things. They see the Holy Spirit come. They see the, the tongues of fire. They hear the sound like a rushing wind. And they see people speak in languages that aren't their own. And these people who are seeing all of this stuff are wondering what the heck is going on. They know that what is happening is, is amazing, but they don't, they don't understand it. And so Peter, Peter does his thing. With the power of the Holy Spirit, he preaches a sermon to these people. Now, we heard some of his sermon a few moments ago. Mike read it to us in our first scripture reading. That was, that was Peter's sermon. It is a powerful message. It contains the gospel. This is what Peter preaches to these people gathered around. Peter says in his sermon that Jesus who is a man attested by God by, by deeds of power and wonder and signs. This man, Peter says, was crucified and killed, but God raised Jesus up, having freed him from death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. It's an amazing sermon. Peter 
tells them clearly that salvation has finally come. And so just try to picture that, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit with all the light and, and sound that's going on there, and then the most amazing sermon that you've ever heard, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached in a formal sermon for the first time ever. And we wonder as we read that, as we hear Peter's sermon, how will the crowd respond, this enormous crowd hearing the good news of the gospel for the first time? What will they do? And our text this morning answers that question. How does the crowd respond to Peter's sermon? And so we're going to pick up in the book of Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 37. Hear the word of God. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter and and they and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 3,000 people. Can you, uh, can you picture that? Wouldn't that be the best new members group ever. We would have to rent a building or build a new building or something to do that. We'd have to do it outside. But the church in Acts, they go from 120 people to 3,120 people. That is the reaction that Peter gets to, to this sermon that the Holy Spirit works through him. Now, they've all just heard this, this amazing sermon in the sermon, they hear scripture from the Old Testament. They hear prophecy and, uh, and they hear about Jesus and they hear about salvation. Peter just crams it all in there. And how does this huge crowd react to Peter's sermon? Now, the last few weeks that we've been in the book of Acts, we have talked about how God works on the outside. The book of Acts starts with this absolutely outward focus. We're called to, to share the love of God with those outside the walls of the church. Acts is all about that. But here in our text this morning, God works on the inside because this is their reaction to Peter's sermon. Luke, the author here, Luke tells us that the people who heard Peter's sermon were cut to the heart. That's the phrase that Luke uses here. That's their reaction. They are cut to the heart. Their reaction starts on the inside with something that happens all the way down into their hearts. They were cut deeply, Luke writes, to the heart. Now, if you're not put off by the Greek, I will just tell you that uh, what Luke writes here is katanugesin tain cardian. And you'll maybe recognize that last word as heart because it sounds like cardio, right? But that first word is a big word that, that just means cut, katanugesin. But it means more than just cut or, or pierced. It can also mean broken or damaged or hurt but even slow or sluggish. It's only used, this word is only used as a verb right here in all of the Bible. And, and so we, it's kind of a mysterious word. And, and so we wonder, what does it mean then to be cut to the heart? To have a broken heart, to have a heart slowed. Peter preaches the gospel, the Holy Spirit works and people are cut to the heart. That's what happens when people like you and me hear the gospel. We are cut to the heart. But what does that mean? 
Now, fortunately, we learn a lot about what happens here from Luke in our text. Because when Luke says that people were cut to the heart, they immediately turn to Peter and the apostles and they, they, they wonder what to do. They, they look at them and they say, brothers, what shall we do? And you can just hear their longing in that, their need and their desperation. They've heard about Jesus. They've heard about his death and his resurrection. And they now know this truth so profoundly that they turn to the disciples with this hurt and this, this longing, this pain in their hearts. They turn with these, these broken hearts, these, these sluggish hearts. And they ask this question of deep response. What should we do? Their response is super emotional. But you know, it is not just emotional. It is deeper than that. Their response is also not typical in the book of Acts. There are other times in the book of Acts when people respond to the gospel and when they do that, and we'll we'll see some of these things as we go through the book of Acts together, sometimes people respond to the gospel with a different order or a different pattern than what we see this morning. This is also nothing like an altar call. Peter did not ask these people to come forward or to raise their hand or anything like that to make this commitment that they're making. There's no sinner's prayer here, if you you know about that. Sometimes, you know, preachers will ask a congregation to pray a prayer of commitment together. And I've done that here with you several times. I'm sure I'll do it again. It's a great thing to do. But Peter doesn't do that here. That's not part of the way people respond to in the text. Being cut to the heart is more than just a one-time commitment. Now, there's a problem, isn't there, when we respond to the gospel with just a one-time commitment anyway? You know, maybe we'll hear a, a deeply moving sermon and we make some kind of a commitment, but then we find that nothing really changes in our lives. I've done that. Probably many of us have. We're, we're moved by the Spirit to respond, but then we find that it, it doesn't last. It's just responding to an altar call, maybe, or... Maybe it's just responding to this idea that we hear in our culture of accepting Jesus. As if someone could just accept Jesus without becoming a disciple, without becoming a follower of Jesus. So that, that's not happening here. The people who hear Peter's sermon aren't just making a one-time commitment. They're not just accepting Christ, if you know what I mean by that. That's a modern phrase It's not in the Bible. What's in the Bible is that we receive Jesus Christ, which is a completely different thing. What happens in the text is that people are becoming disciples. It's it's a change that takes place all the way to the core of their being. They didn't do this. Peter didn't do this. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. This is how people respond to the gospel in the text. They are cut to the heart. It is deep and it changes all of life. Kata, kata nugesen, they are broken hearted. They are pained deeply. They are slowed all the way through to their hearts. They are stopped and they respond. What shall we do? Now, if you're kind of a church history geek, you might be thinking about John, uh, John Wesley right now because, you know, John Wesley has this really famous moment in his life that he writes about and is famous for uh, that is a lot like what happens in our text. John Wesley, you know, is a, a, a preacher in England in the, in the 18th century. He uh, also came to America and founded the Methodist movement Now, don't worry too much about a Presbyterian talking about a Methodist. It's going to be okay. We like John Wesley. Wesley, you know, was a traveling preacher. So he he went around preaching the gospel and he brought all kinds of people to Christ. 
But there was a dark time in his life when he felt like his faith was gone. That's how he felt. But then he was cut to the heart, just like our sermon text this morning, just like Luke is describing. Dan Graves writes a bit about Wesley. He writes this. John Wesley was almost in despair. He did not have the faith to continue to preach. When death stared him in the face, he was fearful and found little comfort in his religion. To a friend, he confessed his growing misery and his decision to give up the ministry. His friend counseled otherwise. Preach faith till you have it, he advised. And then because you have it, you will preach faith. John Wesley acted on the advice. He led a prisoner to Christ by preaching faith in Christ alone for forgiveness of sins. The prisoner was immediately converted and John was astonished. He had been struggling for years. Here was a man transformed instantly. John found himself crying out, Lord, help my unbelief. However, he felt dull within and little motivated even to pray for his own salvation. On May 24, 1738, he reluctantly attended a meeting in Aldersgate. Someone at that meeting read from a text by Martin Luther. Wesley writes, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through the faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That's the kind of deep change that God works in people's hearts. God works that change in our hearts too. When the people in Acts, are, in Acts 2 are, are cut to the heart, they repent and they are baptized. Their sins are forgiven and they receive the Holy Spirit. That's all in the text. They also let themselves be saved by God. That's in verse 40. Our translation actually renders that kind of weirdly, but we don't want to miss that even salvation by God is in the text. Because that's the point of all of that, is that as this is happening, as these people are cut to the heart, so much is occurring. Repentance, baptism, forgiveness of sins, salvation. This is deep and it is complete transformation. Have you ever been cut to the heart by the Holy Spirit? Maybe you had some big moment when God spoke to you. Or maybe God spoke to you at some point through a friend or a group leader or a Sunday school teacher. Maybe you were cut to the heart at a summer camp or a retreat that you had. Maybe it was a sermon, just like in the text. Whatever it was, it was more than emotional. It is more than emotional. It is more than a one-time altar call sort of thing. Because being cut to the heart is a response that can only be caused by the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the Holy Spirit using the gospel in your heart. That's what Peter was preaching. We're not cut to the heart by good worship music or dynamic preaching or emotion. We are cut to the heart. It is a response to the gospel. It is a response to the good news that Jesus Christ has forgiven your sin. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a work that God does in you. Or maybe, maybe you're more like John Wesley, waiting, waiting and, and looking for the work of the Spirit. Maybe it doesn't happen in an instant for you. It takes time. Maybe your heart is slowed and you're in a season to be attentive right now, to be, to be listening 
for the gospel. Because the gospel comes to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. Something, something deep in our hearts that causes a huge transformation. Everything from repentance to baptism to forgiveness of sins and even salvation. That's what God wants to do in your heart, deep inside you. I think we always want to be looking for those moments when God breaks our hearts. And when we find them, we want to respond just like the believers do in the text. God, you know, can do that right now, this very morning. And we want to pray for that. We want to pray that God would slow our hearts, that God would, would, would cut us deep inside with his love and his grace. And so let's pray together. Holy God,